And it is good to gather together. And as we're into the Christmas week, which is crazy to think about, you know, a lot of times we stop and we think about things when we were younger. One of the traditions we had at our family was a unique tradition in that we, we lived in a little story and a half growing up, and there's four boys. I'm the oldest of four. And, and uh, what we were never allowed to go into where Christmas morning is by the tree until um, after mom and dad had gone in first, right? We would always wake up early. We would, we would put different alarms and all their kind of things to wake them up early on Christmas morning. And uh, when we lived on the, uh, all the boys were up in two bedrooms upstairs, and uh, we had to sit upstairs until dad came down. So we would like pound on the floor, and we would try to wake them up. And every year, my dad would come out, and he would go, wow, what's all this stuff? As we're sitting up with eager anticipation. Look at all this coal. Who put all this coal in the stockings? He was just mean. That's just all it was. He was just me. No, he's a sweet guy. But, but, he, but there, were, there, were, there were many years I wondered if he was being truthful. Because the truth is, I was a very non-compliant child. Um, as a child, I, I was very melancholy. I was very active in my mind. My mind went 400 miles an hour. And my imagination overproduced. But I had a lot of difficulty expressing with words what I was thinking. And as a result, as a kid, many times what would happen is I became very comparison-oriented with other people. I became comparison-oriented with friends at school, comparison-oriented with my, with my brothers. I felt a lot of times that I deserved so much more than I got. That there were times in knowing that we didn't grow up with much, we didn't have much to have. And, 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 and I had this comparison aspect that too often impacted my attitudes and choices, and even though I'd like to say it was just a kid thing, the truth is, all of us around, especially Christmas season, but all of us, we tend to think we deserve more good things than sometimes we actually have. All right? It seems like other people get maybe what we deserve, or maybe they're getting more than they deserved. And Isaiah 59, verse 9, it says, we look for the light, but instead all we find is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in deep shadows. Oh, it's a different way to start, but I'm so grateful that all of you are here and those that are in Manchester that we're here because we're, we got a, a little different service. And, and next week, I just want to tell you, next week's service for Christmas services will be the same service all three times here in, in, in um, Cedar Rapids. We've got the one service in Manchester. It is going to be an empowerful, incredible, uh, unique service this Christmas season. And what we're doing right now is we're working in the, right, our, our At The Movies series. And, and some of you are familiar with the name Clive Staples Lewis, maybe better known as C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was, became a pretty devout, staunch atheist at the age of 15. But he, became a, he, was, a, he was brilliant, and he became one of the top literary scholars in our world. And, and really, he, he fought against Christianity, couldn't grasp it because he thought, so there are way too many problems to allow for a good God. And that was where he lived. Until about age 29, he started encountering someone who started nudging him, someone that was brilliant and articulate like he was, but started nudging him towards Jesus. And at age 31, he finally got this turning point in his life, and he wrote it in the book called Surprised by Joy, where he was surprised that there was joy. That was the big thing that turned him around, that you could find joy through encountering Jesus, and it's also lots of different things in the aspects of that book. But he began exploring meaning and purpose. He was a prolific writer. He wrote lots of different things. He wrote deep scholarly works like Mere Christianity and The Problem of Pain that take the really deep dives into what life is about. One of his most beloved series was a series called Chronicles of Narnia. And if you've ever read it, I had a friend that, that read it, the whole series, every Thanksgiving. He would sit down during Thanksgiving break and he would read the whole series for years and years and years. And, and, and Chronicles of Narnia, and it starts with the lion, the witch, and the war, wardrobe. And his goal was to grasp, help Christianity be presented in a way that even young ones could grasp. And so today we're going to look at that movie. And just a reminder, we, we, it's just, we use the movie clips as just an illustration of God's word. But what's interesting with this movie is it really is a direct correlation with the story of Jesus. And if there are kids in the room, just know there's a little bit of an intensity warning in some of our clips today. It's not going to be quite as cute as the kids' musicals last week um, and all those pieces. But the story starts with this. In World War II, the Pevensey kids, the, they were, their dad was sent off to war. 
And so for safety's sake, they were sent to a distant relative's home for safety out in the country. And one day while they're playing a game, Lucy, the youngest, stumbles upon this wardrobe and she opens it up to go hide in it. But as she hides, she realizes she just keeps going and going and stumbles into a forest. And while she's there, she enters into this wintry wonderland, so to speak, and she meets a young man named Mr. Tumnus. And he was a fawn, half deer, half person. And Mr. Tumnus, when he was explaining this place that she ended up, he, he said this. He says, it's winter in Narnia and has been for ever so long. Always winter, but never Christmas. Let's be honest, even those in the Midwest, no one really loves the cold. <laughs> we, we tolerate it and we look for breaks and we can have a break from it. And that's why we love Christmas. It's a little break. It's a highlight in the moment. But when there is no break and no relief, only winter and only cold. It does something to the soul. So here's what happens. When they go into Narnia, what the story is, is there is a witch that has a reign over Narnia. And, and as a result, there is no relief from the winter. And Edmund Pevensey, as we'll see, he's the third born, but really the main character of the story. The oldest is Peter. Peter is the man of the house. He's striking and, and has, wants to be the hero. Susan is the oldest daughter, very matriarchal, lovely. And Lucy is the youngest and the cutest. And Edmund, as a result, is very bitter towards his siblings. He's, he's always jealous of them. He always feels like he's getting put down, that he's the last one. His voice doesn't matter. And the, his brothers and sisters seem to shame him. And, and as a result, he uses power over Lucy. And it's not a really healthy dynamic amongst the siblings. And when he stumbles into Narnia, while well, he's there by himself, he ends up meeting the witch of winter. And he learns quickly how our suffering and our pain can very easily be turned against us. When it's always winter, we are very, very susceptible. See, Edmund longed to be noticed. He wanted to be recognized. And he desperately wanted to be special. That's what you see in, in Edmund. And one of the things we know about the witch, but also the enemy in the world in which we live, is that the enemy will manipulate you to chase what you feel you deserve. The enemy is gifted at that. Right? Edmund was driven by the feeling that the witch gave him. She, she noticed him. He, he was important to her. He was valued. And then she reinforced those with rewards, gave him sweets. Gave him a little Turkish delight, just a little syrup and starch and maybe a little rose water or orange. And, and he was just fixated on that reward of the feeling that he had. And like it or not, you and I are just as easily manipulated. We, we, we chase things that make us feel special. We love when we get a little reward for it and it keeps us coming back for more and more because the enemy knows how to play us. In 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So why the, the queen is, is white and beautiful in this story. Or we long for purpose and fulfillment. We long for satisfaction. And we chase ways to indulge those desires. One of the things that's just true in life is that indulging your desires will take you farther than you want to go, will keep you longer than you want to stay, and will cost you more than you want to pay. Life seems good for a while, but we all know life gets complicated. And everyone is driven to desire light. All of us are. We're just that we desire hope and love and peace and joy. Have you ever noticed how often it's just still covered in shadows? We want those things and we get a taste of it, but there's still a shadow covering it. And maybe we, we find a little relief in coffee in the morning or watching TV or a little drink after work. And maybe we seem for a moment we have a break from winter. But every one of those little dopamine hits that we take with the sweets, with the break, with the things that we do, all they do, we, we've talked about it before, is they just turn off fear in our brain for a little moment. But it, turned back, it turns back on, and so we indulge again, and we chase something again, and, and we look for pleasures and achievements or sex or relationships to get that relief, only to find out it's still winter, and those issues haven't gone away. So in Job, and talking about the, the enemy and what he does to us in Job chapter 12, verse 25, it says, they, we grope in the darkness without a light, and he makes them stagger like drunkards. And you and I, we end up going on a journey that we never expected. 
We deal with feelings and make choices we never thought we would actually make. All in the chance to maybe get one more bite of another num-num. Edmund comes to the point where he turns on his siblings, turns them in and the people that he loved. And how is it that so often and so many times in our lives, uh, we become capable of making choices we never thought we would ever make? In Ephesians 4.18, it says their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life that God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. Edmund, in a sense, was entrapped because he longed for Turkish delight, but truly, he really longed for power and control, to be noticed, to have value. And maybe even when I read a verse like this, so often many of us, right, we've been walking with the Lord for a while, or we've been, we're good people. We look at that and we say, well, I'm not really dealing with that much shame. I'm not dealing with illicit sex and impurity all the time. And maybe we're not. But we are all indulging in things that give us life. Indulging in things, not, and not because, and, and we're not being honest with which things we're really indulging in. Here's the truth. Everything we chase has a cost. Everything we chase has a cost. See, C.S. Lewis had become an atheist because he couldn't justify how a good God could allow evil. But as he understood the complexities more of the world and saw it in a deeper understanding, he began to see the true truth. And the truth is this. Hell is the place that you go when you choose to justify satisfying your own desires. You are simply paying the tab for the life you've chosen to indulge. We're free to make whatever choices we want to make. Every one of us, we are free to make those choices, but we are also responsible for those choices. All right, in this story, Edmund's choices put people's actual lives, his brothers and sisters' lives are put at risk because of his choices. What if we could see the eternal realities of what our choices actually cost us? That we could actually see the consequences. What if they played out in real time like Edmund's did? You see, Edmund, a little bit later in the story, is able to escape his captivity from the witch, but he is not able to escape the consequences of his actions. In fact, none of us can escape the consequences of our indulgence or feeding our desires. In this story, Aslan represents Jesus. And, 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 and there, you see in this moment, right, there is a cost for life. When we play with it, thinking we can do with whatever we want with our, with a, on our own, with our own lives, but the truth is there is a cost. This is Aslan and made reference with the witch is referring to Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, where it says, the life of the body is in its blood. I have given you the blood on the altar to purify you, making you right with the Lord. It is the blood given in exchange for life that makes purification possible. All right, we, we see this. Edmund, he can't escape the cost. And in that intent, when he talks to, when Aslan is talking to, to the witch, one of the things that they come to an agreement is that Aslan will give his life in exchange for Edmund's. Because even Aslan couldn't make the penalty go away. Edmund messed up an entire world because of his desires, because of his wants. And because he was tired of just always being the middle child who was overlooked and underappreciated, and he was always the problem. And the reason C.S. Lewis wrote this this way is he intentionally wrote that Edmund is not likable. Because here's the truth. You are Edmund. I am Edmund. We like to identify ourselves as the hero in every story. But really, we are the ones that deserve no pity. We want to be Peter, brave and heroic, the young king. The, the sons and daughters of Adam are the ones that are to come to Narnia and bring, bring healing and restoration and end the, the everlong winter. We want to be, and Peter is meant to be the king that comes in. We want to be Susan, who is lovely and caring and nurturing. We, or we want to be Lucy, who is so likable 
and so adventurous and just chases and enjoys life. But the truth is we're Edmund, the source of more problems than we would want to admit, more bitterness, more brokenness, more hurting, more longing. It's interesting in the story is it isn't Peter that Aslan steps in for. It isn't Susie that Aslan steps in for. It isn't. I mean, it would make sense if it was Lucy. Of course, you would step in to save Lucy. But Aslan, the great lion, the source of Christmas, the source of springtime. He's the one where every one of his footsteps, every time his footprint leaves, life is left in in its wake. He is the one willing to take Edmund's place. No one would be willing to make that trade. But he did. He is willing to be humbled, stripped of his power, mocked by those he could easily defeat with one swipe of his paw so that Edmund's life could be spared. Maybe thinking, Pastor Brian, what in the world does this have to do with Christmas? This has everything to do with Christmas. This is the only reason we have Christmas. This world is full of Edmonds who deserve nothing, who should have to pay for their choices, who aren't likable, who have done enough to to chase their own realities. But God stepped into our reality, into our world to save us from our indulgences. In Matthew 1, 21, where it says, and he will have a son and you will, and he are to name him Jesus and he will save his people from their sins. The purpose of Christmas is one. There's one purpose and it's to bring an end for our forever winter. It is to save us from our sins and there is a cost for it. It costs greatly. You and I, we deserve no pity. We have taken every, walked into every one of the enemy's traps. We have overindulged in everything that poisons our lives. But our creator was willing to come and make himself vulnerable to everything that he could wipe away with one word. He humbled himself and was willing to give his life for ours. First Peter chapter two, verse 22, it says he never sinned, never deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted or threatened revenge. When he suffered, he left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we could be dead to sin and live for what is right. Christmas has one purpose, God rescuing us from our sins, even though we have done nothing to deserve it. You and I are not the heroes in the story of Christmas. We are the cause of all the drama we face. So I want to give you three simple things. How should we honestly celebrate Christmas? As we go into this last week, what are the way, what way should we really honestly celebrate Christmas? First and foremost, we must acknowledge our indulgences. We must acknowledge our indulgences. Christmas is a reminder that we must bring everything that we think makes us feel important or valued or comforted, anything that we indulge in to make us feel We need to bring that into God's presence and admit it. The enemy will make us feel like it's no big deal, that it's what we deserve. But those indulgences are our poison and our prison. The addictions, the credit card debt, the conflicts that we get into relationships, all the things that we face that we have to pay a price for. In John 3, 19, the judgment is based on this fact, that the light of heaven came into the world, but they loved the darkness more than the light. For their actions were evil. They hate the light because they want to sin in the darkness. Where we want to have our indulgences where nobody sees them. And they stay away from the light for the fear that their sins will be exposed and they will be punished. But this Christmas, can I tell you the greatest thing you can do with Christmas is just say, God, here I am. Here's, here's the weaknesses I have. Here's my longings. Here's the things I'd be willing to chase and turn my family in and do other things. Here's the reality. Cause he already knows it. Why do we need to hide it? 
When we pray the Lord's Prayer, God, forgive me my debts. Every day we should be praying, Lord, this is what I indulged in today. I bring it to you because He already knows. And because of that, we can celebrate Christmas honestly when we remember that you and I deserve no mercy. So cling to it. Cling to his mercy. All right, we, we don't deserve pity. We're not the likable characters in the book, but he still gives us mercy. Like Aslan was willing to step in for Edmund. This story would have been totally different if he stepped in for Lucy. It would have been totally different if he stepped in for, for Susan or for Peter. But he stepped in for Edmund. Undeserved. With forgiveness and compassion. Or we, we have every right. God has every right to see us punished. But he offers us compassion. And he's willing to pay our debt. Here's one of the things that I, I'm convinced of. I really am convinced that mercy is probably one of the least understood attributes of God. To really understand his mercy that he has for us, for you, it should rock our world daily. Every day it should have an impact upon us. In 1 Peter 2, 24, it says, by his wounds, you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your soul. Every day, something inside of us should be moved because of his mercy. We haven't realized the fullness of his glory, but we can cling to his mercy. We can be grateful for his mercy. Christmas is a celebration of mercy. That God has given us his life, right? You, you, you and I were on our way to prison. They were coming for your house. They were coming to rip your kids away from you, and you deserved it. But in the last minute, God, Jesus steps in as a baby, as a child, and says, I will take every punishment they deserve. I will take it. I could, he could wipe it all away. He didn't deserve it, but he took instead when you and I realize that we are Edmund, we are unlikable and to blame for all the chaos around us. And yet we get mercy. That's why Christmas, we should really celebrate Christmas by putting mercy on full display. Put it on display. You need to live it out. Your life should lead with joy and mercy and his life every moment. Because of Christmas, you have the reality. Christmas and Easter are intrinsically tied together. Those two things cannot be separated. Or we live in a world where our self-competence is what leads us. And we, we have an ability to create indulgences for ourselves and to fulfill our indulgences. But instead, we need to lead with mercy. Let mercy lead you. It's my life is blessed. Things could never be better than they are because of the gift of God's mercy. As it says in Ephesians 5.8. For though your hearts were once full of darkness, you are now full of light from the Lord and your behavior should show it. Our lives should show mercy, should show the joy, should show the goodness, should show the love as we're coming into this week. It's one of my favorite phrases that hit me years ago and has forever changed the way that I live. When Jesus is your everything, the rest of life becomes a bonus. Do you want to live as though the rest of, that you get more than you deserve? Understand Jesus is your everything. And then everything else you, you get, everything else you enjoy, everything else you participate in becomes a bonus that he is willing to give to you. All right, when your life is all you can make it, you and I, we protect it and we hold on to it and we long for more. We don't want Peter to become king. We don't want somebody else to get noticed the way that we're noticed. But because of Christmas and God's mercy on full display, mercy covers us completely. So how can we trust in his mercy? Because there is nothing that can stand in our God's way. Because of the mercy of Jesus, the source of life, he humbled himself, became a child, lived the human condition, and yet never indulged in any of humanity's poisons. His pure life, his pure joy, his pure peace, and out of pure mercy, a mercy you don't deserve, Edmund. 
He laid down his life and sacrificed it for us. We can trust God's motives, his power, his love, because he will save you. He will have mercy on you. We can agree with Psalm 107, 13. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He led them from the darkness and the deepest gloom. He snapped their chains and let them praise the Lord for his great love and for his wonderful things that he has done for them. As we go into this Christmas season, can I tell you, we can remember why we really celebrate because God has shown mercy to us that we deserve nothing. And yet he's given us everything. I want to encourage you. Can you, are you clinging to his mercy? Are you just taking his mercy for granted? Are you just w wondering about whether or not what's the big deal? But we need to understand that we get to live with his mercy on full display, that he loves us. He cares for us. He sees everything that we're going through, and he gave his life that this week, especially when we go into remembering what this season is truly about, that is about his goodness, his love, his grace his mercy to set you free and let you live fully with everything that he has for you. Let's pray. So Jesus, we come together today and we thank you, God, for this Christmas season. I love the story because your story, sometimes we have made it so religious in our approach to how we are to encounter you. The story of Jesus in a manger and shepherds and angels is almost a cute backdrop for food and presence. And I love how the story strips all of that away and reminds us that without Jesus, it would be winter, always winter, and never Christmas. God, that you've reminded us that we are like Edmund. We deserve no mercy. We deserve no pity. And yet you were willing, the creator of the universe, the one who put stars and galaxies in place, the one who knits the smallest of intricacies in our bodies together, is willing to humble himself and become a child. to save us. God, may that act of mercy have a profound impact on us this year. I just want to ask you as everyone's praying, maybe today God spoke to you as we kind of stripped away the typical cuteness factors and hit kind of the, the depth of what indulgences really do to us. And God is speaking to your heart and just reminding you today that you can find hope and life in him. And no matter what you're trying to chase, what you're trying to look after, those things won't bring meaning. Surrendering to him, finding life in him is the fullness of purpose and peace and joy and love. That sacrifice is the gift of Christmas a sacrifice that was given on your behalf that you don't deserve. And maybe for some, this, this might be a, a week. I'm praying that today might be a day that sets so many of you free from the things that might hold you back or tie you up or give you overly worried and concerned going into this week, but that you would understand the mercy God has on you the mercy God has on others around you and the fact that you can live with his mercy out loud and showing it to others. Maybe today you really do identify yourself as Edmund and inside you're like, There's, if people only knew what I did behind the scenes, if God really knew he would never love me, but I'm telling you today, the love that God has for you is real and forever. And if today is the day that you're just saying, you know what, going into this Christmas season, I need to know that I know that I know that Jesus has mercy on me and that I can find life in him. 
And if that's you and that's your heart today, I just want to pray with you. And, and whether you're in Manchester or you're here or maybe you're online, I just want you in a way of just symbolically saying this is what's going on in my heart. Just will you just put a hand up just saying, Pastor Brian, that's me today. I, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. There's been too many things I've been indulging in my life, too many other things that I've been chasing. Yeah, thank you. From the balcony, you can put your hands down. Maybe today as you're walking into this week, that there are opportunities for you just to say, Lord, I pray that I would put all those worries and all those cares and all those chasing things aside and remember that you are the gift that allows me to find joy and hope in everything. And I really pray next week as you come and our Christmas service, you invite, I know some go to travel with the family, but if you're here, invite someone to join you. It's gonna be a powerful time of just a, a simple celebration of the goodness of God. But today that we just say, Lord, as we're going into this week, we wanna pray. And if you raise your hand, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. In fact, could we all just pray this prayer together? Just saying today, Jesus, I wanna thank you that you were willing to come to lay everything aside to come for me and I admit today I don't deserve it I've chased way too many things that have been poison or a prison to my heart I've tried to hide it but today I lay it before you and I thank you that you were willing to give your life for me and so today, I choose your life. I choose you. Because I believe that you are my purpose and my savior and the best that I can have. So Jesus, we come and we thank you so much that we can give our lives to you, that we can honor you, that we can give you praise. We love you, Jesus. We love the way that you've poured out your life among us and in us and through us. May this week be a precious week, a beautiful week. May it just multiply with the fullness of your presence that you would speak to our hearts and we give all that we are to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.